Welcome to the All of Christ for All of Life podcast, where we equip men and women to be faithful in every aspect of life. This week, you will hear Douglas Wilson's talk, The Integrated Life, from our audio collection titled, from our audio collection titled similarly, The Integrated Life. Before we get started, I just wanted to say from us at Canon Press, thank you guys so much for the listens and the downloads. And for those of you that are subscribing to the Canon app, where you can find this talk and the whole collection with it, because you guys do that, we are able to do more and more at Canon. That means more free content. It means more sweet documentaries and movies and shows behind the app. So from all of us to you, thank you. Well, I want to take the things we talked about last night, the idea of Christian worldview and the various aspects of our lives that right worship and right living and right thinking will bring together and what we talked about in this last talk about vocation and bring it all together, hopefully, or bring at least most of it together, very few peas falling off the plate. Um, in this last talk, the integrated life, the integrated life. So we're coming to put everything together as we are talking about worldview living, not worldview thinking alone, not worldview thinking raw, but worldview living, parish living. Not surprisingly, the thing to remember is the grace of God and the graciousness of God. The axle of the worldview wheel that I was talking about last night. This is very hard for Bible-believing Christians to get their minds around. For some reason, as soon as people start emphasizing the grace of God, a suspicion forms in the back of our minds, perhaps in the front of our minds, that the person is going liberal. Right? That they are starting to talk about the tender side of God, or the, the you know, they're they're starting to give way to you know some false doctrines because we are hard liners because we're fundamentalists and we believe the Bible and we're tired of all these pointy-headed liberals doing what they do. And I'm not saying this as uh, someone who has any kind of sympathy with any kind of liberalism, uh, whatever. I'm fond of joking that if you were to make, draw a political spectrum, I'm slightly to the left of King Arthur. And so this is not, none of this is an accommodation to liberalism. What we want to do is have a rock solid commitment to the Bible as the absolute word of God. What does the Bible teach? What does the Bible emphasize? Now, let me, I'm, I'm going to give you an illustration of this. And I don't, I, I want you to draw the inference from this illustration about our attitudes. I don't want you to draw any false inferences about vocation or political positions or whatever. It's just about how we react. Think of it as a thermometer that you put in your mouth to measure your grace index. Okay. How, how, what is your natural instinctive response? If you had 1,000 Christian young people in law school and they were all graduating and they all the weekend before graduation went back to their home churches and they said oh you're graduating from law school what are you going to do okay let's run this experiment twice let's say 1,000 of them the first time say well I've got a job with the prosecutor's office and I'm going to intern there a while and we're going to put bad guys in jail and then the second time, 1,000 of these students say, well, I'm hoping to go into criminal defense work. I'm hoping to open up a practice of criminal defense work. Out of the first 1,000, how many of them do you think will be asked by inquisitive Christians how they reconcile prosecution with their Christian faith? Zero. How many of them going into defense work will be asked to reconcile their Christian faith with this prospect of defending people in courts of law? About a thousand, right? give or take, give or take a few. Now, why do I bring this up? Well, who's the prosecutor in the Bible? The devil. 
right? Who's the defense attorney in the Bible? Jesus. How do we get it backwards? Why do we get it backwards? Well, it has to do with our attitude and thoughts about grace. Now, let me say, let me hasten to say that there are people who go into criminal defense work who are skunks, who want to get the guilty off and they get them off on technicalities and all the stuff that shows up in newspapers and that makes our blood boil. Yeah, that happens. And let's also say that in a fallen world, prosecution of criminal offenses is a necessary thing to do. But when a Christian goes into the work of accusation, he should be on pins and needles the whole time. He should know he is attempting in the spirit of Jesus to undertake work that the devil is really good at. The devil loves accusing the brethren day and night, as it says in the book of Revelation. The devil comes before God in the book of Job and accuses Job. If there's a bony pointing finger in the Bible, it's probably the devil's. You did this, and you did this, and you did this, and you did this. In the Bible, overwhelmingly, in the narrative of Scripture, accusation, slander. In fact, uh, diabolos, the word diabolical, the word related to it can be rendered as blaspheming or, or slander. Accusation is what just... That's the way the devil works. Accusation and slander. And Jesus is, we have, a, if anyone sins, it says in 1 John, we have an advocate. We have a defense attorney with the Father. Jesus steps to our defense. Now, don't, don't you want to be like that? Well, yeah, I do want to be like that. I want to defend those who are attacked. I want to, but you might, you might find, if you do that, you might find yourself defending the guilty. Well, like Jesus did with me. <laughs> What's different? Right? Jesus. Now, defending the guilty, it's necessary to reconcile with justice. That's a, that is a thorny problem. But God solved that problem in the cross. That's what the cross is all about, is reconciling justice and mercy. That's where justice and mercy kiss. But we're suspicious of it. We're suspicious of it because we don't really believe in grace. We believe in law. Right? We believe in law. Now... I can't say we, we don't believe in grace, we believe in law, without hastening to assure you all that I also believe in law as a subordinate thing contextualized by the grace of God. Right? The justice of God, the righteousness of God, the holiness of God has to be understood in the context of God being love itself. Now. Having said all that, I believe in hell, I believe in judgment, I believe in the wrath of God, I believe in the severities of the law, everything the Bible says about all that, I believe it. Right? And I think we should all believe it. But we should equally believe in what the Bible tells us about the tender mercies of God, the kindness of God, the forbearance of God, the patience of God, and the grace of God. And this is a place where we stumble particularly, and frequently we stumble in our homes. We stumble in how we present the Word of God to our kids. Do they have an ongoing experience of grace upon grace, after grace, just an environment of grace? Sometime here in Clinton, I forget, uh, when I was talking, maybe Thursday night, I forget. I used the illustration in the context of a Christian school where it says in Deuteronomy that you shall not boil a kid in its mother's milk. He shall not boil a kid in his mother's milk. What is, that, what is that law forbidding? When it says you shall not muzzle the ox, and Paul says in the New Testament, is it oxen God's concerned about? Well, obviously, in the narrow sense, but he, there's a much larger principle, right? The laborer is worthy of his hire. That's the principle. That's why you don't muzzle the ox. What's the principle behind you shall not boil a baby goat in the milk of its mother? You shall not take that which God intended to nourish life and turn it into an instrument of death. You shall not take that which was intended to impart life and turn it into an instrument of death. What do we do with education, which is a child's life? We turn it into an instrument of death. What do we do with Sabbath keeping, which is our life? We turn it into a list of things you can't do. 
right? God says, I tell you what, I tell you what, I want you to work for six days, and every once a week, I, Jehovah, am mandating a, a mandatory day off. Take it easy. Act like a sloth doing yoga. Okay? Just take it easy. And I've done this for you. I, I didn't create the world so that I could have men running around having to keep the Sabbath. I didn't make you for the Sabbath. I made the Sabbath for you. The Sabbath is made for man, not man for the Sabbath. This is a present. Deal with it. I'm being nice to you. Deal with it. I'm giving you time off. Deal with it. And so what we do is we turn it into a law. So we sit on the front porch glaring at bicyclists. You know, we read the Presbyterian Herald and we <laughs> and we say, yell Sabbath breaker after them going, going down the street. God's being kind to us and we can turn anything into a rule, to turn anything into a cauldron to cook people in. Right? So, the Sabbath is just a wonderful blessing. It's a, it's a glorious thing. It's a time when God gives you time off. And you, you're trudging home after a hard uh, day at work Saturday, and you think, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy. I get to worship the Lord in the morning. I get to put my feet up and just take it easy. That's what God's like. Not um, when, when someone says, oh no, the fourth commandment. I've got to obey the fourth commandment. And then you start obsessing about all the things you can and cannot do. That's the wrong end. You don't start there. That's not what you do. All right, so we want to think in terms of grace and graciousness. Now, I, I want to assure you that grace has a backbone. Okay, Grace has a backbone. Grace is not relativism. Grace is not liberalism. Grace is not capitulation before the bad guys. Grace has a backbone. Grace conquers the world. Grace overthrows kingdoms. Grace transforms history. Grace is not a Casper milk toast kind of, th kind of thing. Grace is potent. Grace is potent. And its potency should first be experienced by us. So, in Galatians 5, it says, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary, the one to the other, so that you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. All right, so St. Paul tells the Galatians to walk in the Spirit. And he, he's not saying walk in the rules. Now, he tells that he describes what walking in the Spirit is like. He says walking in the Spirit excludes this and includes that. But you don't walk in the Spirit by taking something carved on stone and setting it before you. Walking in the Spirit is, is quite different. And walking in the Spirit means you reject the lust of the flesh. Verse 16. This is because the flesh and the Spirit are contrary to one another. Verse 17. But if the Spirit is leading you, then you are not under the condemnation of the law. Verse 18. When Paul talks about being under the law, he is not talking about being moral. He is talking about being immoral and under condemnation because of it. So being under the law means being under condemnation. It doesn't mean being dutiful. So you're under condemnation because precisely because you're not dutiful. In Romans 6.14, he says, uh, you've probably heard, if you've ever suggested to anybody that they might not want to be doing that because the Bible says you shouldn't, they say, well, we're not under 
not under the law, but under grace. Right? I get to do this because I'm not under the law, I'm under grace. They think that being under law means you can't do it, and being under grace means you can. Right? But that's not what Paul said. In Romans 6.14, he's saying, For sin shall not be your master, for you are not under law, but under grace. Being under law means sin runs you. Being under law means sin owns you. Being under law means that you disobey the law and are therefore condemned by the law. Being under grace means that you're liberated from that, and that liberates you from sin. Okay? We tend to think that being under law, in the Old Testament they were under law, and that means that they could never sin. But now God has had a mood swing between the two Testaments, and we got him some medications or something, and he's now lightened up. And he decided to quit doing the law thing, not letting people sin. And now in the New Testament, he's sort of mellowed, sort of like parents with their fifth kid, right? <laughs> the, the first one, <laughs> the Jews were the first child. Bam, 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 bam. And <laughs> Christians are, oh, wow, we can do anything. Um, <laughs> As though God lightened up between the Testaments. As though law meant that you can't sin and grace means that you get to. But this is exactly backwards. Law meant in the Old Testament that you couldn't stop sinning. right? You, you couldn't stop sinning and you couldn't get away from the condemnation that resulted. And being under grace means that you're liberated, not just from the standard of the law, not from the standard of righteousness, but liberated from the condemnation of the law, which sets you free to walk in the Spirit. All right, so in verse 18, he says, if the Spirit's leading you, you're not under the law. You're not under the condemnation of the law. He then gives us a list of the works of the flesh. And he says that they are manifest. It's pretty clear when the, when the works of the flesh are going on. Now, this is a, 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 an aside, but an important aside. He says here the works of the flesh are manifest. There's a big debate going on in the Reformed world about uh, covenant members who are, not, who are not truly regenerate. Okay? Covenant members who are not truly regenerate. You can't read your Bible without coming across multiple examples of covenant members who were unconverted God-haters. The Bible, they're just all over the place. Okay? Now, the problem is that that truth, which is true, is fashioned into a cudgel to beat up the sheep, to pound the sheep. People who faithfully come to church and who love Jesus and sing the hymns and come to the Lord's Supper, they're told... Frequently, they're told in, under this kind of preaching, you're probably not converted. Did you sin this week? Then how can you say you're a Christian? How can you call yourself an, uh, under the law, under condemnation? Uh, condemnation? But the Bible says we're not under that kind of condemnation. At the same time, it is true that there are covenant members who are, who are evil, rotten people. Right? How can we tell who they are? Well, Paul says the works of the flesh are manifest. They're the ones holding the seances. Okay? Witchcraft. All right? Witchcraft. They're the ones in sedition, idolatry, bowing down to idols, committing adultery, running the porn shop. Um, those are the covenant members whose works are manifest that show that they're not walking in the Spirit. Okay? It's not talking about ordinary, frail Christians who struggle against sin in the ordinary day-to-day -day life of existence. That, that's not what it's talking about at all. So, this list includes sins that we would readily identify with the flesh, you know, sexual sins and so on, but the list is much more broad than that, much more broad than just renegade bodily desires. All right? Um, when someone's a drunk, when someone's adulterous, when someone's lascivious, that's their, they don't have self-control with regard to certain bodily appetites. But it, has, it lists here, under the flesh, things that have nothing to do with bodily appetites. There's no bodily appetite that drives you into witchcraft or that drives you into idolatry or that drives you into hatred or that drives you into heresy. There is, there is no bodily appetite that, that will make you think perhaps Arianism is the truth. Right, that's, not, that's a work of the flesh, but it's not a bodily appetite. 
That's in verses 19 through 21. Those whose lives are characterized by this kind of thing will not inherit the kingdom. Verse 21. All right, people whose lives are characterized by adultery, witchcraft, hatred, strife, you know, all these things. People like that, baptized or not, covenant members or not, church members or not, people who live like that will not inherit the kingdom. They're unconverted people. But the preachers who thunder against unconverted covenant members generally will only pick on converted covenant members because they're the only ones who would put up with that kind of thing. All right? Um, preaching against genuinely unconverted covenant members requires courage. Preaching, you know, this important truth about unconverted covenant members and converted covenant members, preaching this to a room full of converted covenant members is something you can get away with because they're so tender-hearted that they will put up with that sort of stuff from you for 20 years. And they'll, they'll allow you to tyrannize over their conscience because, precisely because they're converted. Right? Precisely because they're long-suffering. Precisely because they honor your position as a pastor and so on. Well, that's another subject that needs to be uh, developed. But ba basically, Paul says the works of the flesh are manifest. And he says the fruit of the Spirit is equally obvious in verses 22 to 23. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its affections and lusts, verse 24. And this being the case, if you live in the Spirit, then you should walk like it, verse 25. And he says, stay away from vainglory, provoking one another, envying one another. That's what vainglory is, uh, s snarling at each other. So, grace which looks a certain way, is the integration point of everything. And the flesh, which is the, the way we are when grace has not intervened, is equally an integration point of that kind of lifestyle. Now, I've talked about Christ, and grace being the axle of all the, all the different things that we do, and the four components of a Christian worldview all tie into Christ, all tie into this axle of grace. So let's talk for a moment about people who get everything right on paper, okay? Who get everything right on paper, but they don't experience the grace of God. This is, you might feel like something's a half a bubble off. You might think, well, something's not quite right. But that's, you've got no authority to say anything to anybody if you think that something's not quite right. You have no authority to address it until it breaks out in manifest works of the flesh, adultery, rebellion, witchcraft. When it, when it erupts like that, then it has to be dealt with in the church. But if you've just got vibes, right? You know, I don't think the person in the third row from the back of the church who slips in quietly after church and then they leave without visiting with very many people, I don't think that they really love Jesus. Right? That kind of thing is just evil. <laughs> right? just, you, don't have, you don't have the authority to say that sort of. Paul says the works of the flesh are manifest. Okay? So when I'm dealing with unconverted covenant members, what I want to do is deal with the big E on the I chart. Okay? And say, you know, I don't think that person is really converted. Why? Well, because he keeps ordaining lesbians. Oh, what gave you the clue, Sherlock? You know, <laughs> that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. That's what we need to deal with. And if we deal with that, the church is going to, if we deal with that kind of manifest stuff, the church is going to be healthy. But if we just do, if all we do is kick around the tender hearts, uh, the, the church is not going to be healthy, and we're not going to have the resources to deal with the great flaming evil that does confront the church. So, grace is the integration point of all things. And I, I want to deal here with grace as the integration point when everything, when you're not dealing with the lesbian, Eskimo, bishop, and that sort of thing. Uh, when, you, when you're dealing with good, solid, believing folks in your tradition of the church. You can have everything right on paper and still be missing something important. But this, what I'm talking about here, should be applied by us in the first place to ourselves and not in the first place to others. 
your doctrine is right. Speaking of the four spokes of the wheel, I spoke, speaking of last night in the worldview wheel, your doctrine is right. Your ethical standards, lifestyle standards are right. Your liturgy is right. And your narrative is right. The story you tell is right. You've learned, all, you've learned the ropes. You've been around. You've, you're in the right tradition. And you, you repeat back the correct things. But if love, joy, peace, patience, and so on don't suffuse the whole of it, then it is a caricature of a biblical worldview, and it is not the authentic thing. You've got a great wheel, but the axle's broke. Right? The wheel is just what it ought to be, but it's not turning. The grace of God invades the world, and the grace of God changes things. God does not come down to give his imprimatur to the way we were living already. All right. God invades the world in Christ, and he sends his spirit to come down and mess up our hair. Okay, I want you to, I want you to be different now. Okay, and then you are. If we cannot get away from the grace of God in the spokes, then the sinful heart tries to keep the axle from turning in such a way that requires the spokes to move. So one trick is to break the spokes or have missing spokes and to have false teaching that says, well, the true Christian faith is one spoke. Propositional affirmation, refer, you know, affirming the truths about the Christian faith. That is true, authentic Christianity, one spoke. Well, if all you have is one spoke, it's not going to turn. Even if it's connected to the axle, it's not, not going to turn, it's not going to roll. Uh, other people have one spoke in its liturgy. Right? If you just get the liturgy right. It doesn't matter what you believe, just get the liturgy right. And this is what the fleshly heart wants to do. But let me run through each of the spokes and, and address what it's like apart from grace, apart from... Now, oh, let me say one other thing about grace. Grace is not spiritual gasoline. Um, grace is God's favor. Grace is God's blessing on you, mediated to you by any number of instruments. It's, it's not a spiritual make-you-go-fast fluid, right? It, that's not what grace is. The Bible speaks sometimes of grace in material terms, grace and peace be multiplied to you, and grace and peace in terms of a transfer. The Bible does speak that way, and we may speak that way, and I have been speaking that way. But don't think that you're like a deep sea diver in your suit, and then you've got a grace hose that runs up to heaven, and the, and the grace comes down, and, and that's how you get grace. God mediates his grace by supernatural intervention when, when you're converted. But God also mediates his grace to you through countless others. The preaching of the word, the sacraments, the encouragement of your friends, the farmer who planted the crop that gave you the breakfast cereal. All of that is the grace of God. Everything is the grace of God, and it's mediated to you from every direction. So I'm speaking of grace in substantive terms the way the Bible does, but we have to make sure that we don't fall into a superstitious definition of a substantive material view of grace. So without grace, what, what happens to these four spokes that I talked about? The four spokes were catechesis, remember, doctrinal affirmation, how do you answer the questions, what do you affirm or believe? Second was lifestyle, how do you actually live? What's your family culture? What's your personal commitment to Christ, how, your lifestyle. Third is liturgy, how you worship. I, actually, last night, uh, third was narrative. Uh, how, you, how do you tell the story of where you are? And then the last was liturgy, liturgy and symbol. So let's work through and see what each one of these looks like without grace. Without grace, propositional affirmation is the devil's religion. Without grace, propositional affirmation is the devil's religion. James 2.19 You believe in one God? Well, good. Good for you, James says. The devil gets that far. <laughs> All right, prop, mere propositional affirmation without grace is no farther than the devil. Does the devil know that God is triune? Yeah. Does the devil believe in a personal devil? <laughs> <laughs> Why, yes, as it turns out. The devil really believes in the devil. Does the devil believe there's such a place as heaven? Yes. Does the devil believe that Jesus came to earth and suffered, bled, died, 
Yeah, he believes that. Does he believe that Jesus rose from the dead? Yeah, he believes that. He affirms all of that. But he affirms all of it without grace. All right, that's the devil's religion. So, if you're just a mere bean counter, if every doctrine were a bean, uh, and you're just a bean counter, and you say, okay, virgin birth, check, full inspiration of Scripture, check, check. And yet, there's no experience of grace in your life. That propositional affirmation is the devil's religion. Second, lifestyle. Without grace, without grace, lifestyle standards are just suffocating moralism. Okay? Without grace, lifestyle standards are suffocating moralism. Matthew 23, 4. The Pharisees were great at tying burdens on people. You can't do this, and you can't do that, and you can't do the other thing. And if you struggle with this, don't come crying to me. God wants you to do it. Suck it up. All right? That is suffocating moralism. So without grace, propositional affirmation, however stalwart, is simply diabolical. Without grace, lifestyle standards are simply the old liberalism. It sometimes surprises uh, contemporary Christians when they, they know of liberal churches, mainline denominational churches that now are more ass of relativism and all kind of, you know, anything goes. But in the early 20th century, liberalism was pretty stout when it came to ethical issues. That's, that was their thing, right? That was the thing that they emphasized. But without grace, standards are an anvil tied around your neck and you're thrown into the sea. Without grace, lifestyle standards are terrible. Okay? Now, I have seen many families in the name of traditional values or homeschooling values or classical education values killing their kids just beating them up i and i, I mentioned recently i've i've seen classical schools from hell <laughs> i've I've seen classical schools that aren't dealing with the real problem. They're not, they're cooking the kids in their mother's milk instead of giving, bestowing the mother's milk on the kids. And I've said this many times in many different situations. And I'll, I'll say it again here. This is a good place for parents and for educators and for pastors and elders of churches. Your job is not to get the kids or the disciples or the congregants or whoever it is, the students. Your job is not to get them to conform to the standard. The job is to get them to love the standard. Right? That's our task. You've got a room full of kids before you. Your task is not to get them a certain grade on the SAT. Your job is to get them to love whatever they do. Right? That's the task. And I tell parents, if your kid doesn't love the standard, lower the standard. And, and you can see the law orientation of traditional values Christians, because when I say low, from the pulpit, lower the standard, and all God's people said, yikes. <laughs> you don't know what moral disorder you're introducing into my home, right? I can't lower the standard. I can't lower the standard because my, my kids are anarchists. They're terrorists. <laughs> and if I lower the standard, then they're going to run roughshod. Into the, no, I, I believe in firm discipline. A home should run smoothly and well, and I think kids should clear the table after they eat, and they should take off their shoes at the door like Mom says. I believe they, they should do all that because they love it. Because they love their mom, they love their dad, they love being here, they love it. That's why they should do it. Because here, when I say lower the standard and don't raise it again until everybody loves it, you know what I'm doing? I'm lowering the standard for the kids, but I'm raising the standard for the parents. And the parents actually want the high standards for the kids and the low standards for them. And when the kids fail to meet the high standard, they get yelled at, which is a low standard for me. All right? Let me illustrate this. This is under the lifestyle thing, and what happens without grace. Suppose you've got a kid who's chewing with his mouth open, a seven-year-old boy, chewing with his mouth open at the table again. Okay? And he's been told 2,000 times maybe not to do that. 
All right? He's been spoken to. And he's been spoken to harshly and angrily and bitterly. And he's, there he is at the table again, chewing with his mouth open. And dad erupts, kaboom, and takes his head off. Yells at him, stop that. How many times? And suppose I were to be a fly on the wall and I saw that and I take the other side. Now, why didn't, didn't you want your son chewing with his mouth open? That's bad manners. I see. And tearing someone's head off at the dinner table isn't. Who's got worse manners, you or your boy? <laughs> you got, you're the dad and you're appalling, right? You're appalling. And all this kid did is chew with his mouth open, right? You blew away someone created in the image of God. And you think he's got bad manners? <laughs> what, what, what's your sense of priority? Now, am I saying, this, is this the preacher's uh, blank check for every boy in the world to chew with his mouth open? No, he ought not to chew with his mouth open. No, he ought to be corrected. He needs to learn good manners from people who know what good manners are. Right. And that means dad and mom conform to the standard, and dad and mom love the standard, and dad and mom insist that the kids conform to the standard, and dad and mom insist that the kids love the standard. And you think, oh, I can't... How can I dictate what they love? Without grace, you can't. Right? That's, the, that's the issue. With grace, when you're functioning in the grace of God, you love God, you love your wife, you, your wife loves you, you love the kids, and the whole thing's in an environment of grace. And kids love what their parents love when they are loved. Kids love what the parents love when they are loved. Without grace, lifestyle standards are suffocating moralism. Matthew 23, 4. Without grace, liturgy is mumbo-jumbo and parading about. Amos 5, 21 through 24. Without grace, liturgy is just another initiation at the Moose Lodge. Okay? God doesn't care. God hates it. God, who requires of you this trampling of my courts? Who told you to come in here dressed like that? I didn't want to see Gandalf. <laughs> <laughs> and what's with the hat? <laughs> God knocks the hat off. Um, now, liturgy, apart from grace, is just putting on a little show trying to impress God. And the Bible repeatedly makes fun of it. The Bible has no patience with it. But when Jesus says, beware of those who like to parade around in long robes, he's not, he's not preaching against robes. When he said that, he was wearing a robe. Everybody wore robes. Right? And the disciples were wearing robes. And so when he says people who want to showboat, people who want to deck themselves like, out like a circus horse and make lengthy prayers in the synagogues and do their thing on the street corner. He's talking about showboating. The disciples didn't disappear when, after he said that and show back up in flannel shirts and blue jeans and logging boots. <laughs> Suppose one of them had shown back up. Well, got the memo on the robes. Uh, here I am. <laughs> All right, so the problem is not robes. The problem is showboating. And we showboat with anything, right? Because Jesus says, let no one call you rabbi, because that was a showboating technique. And uh, you can do the same thing by insisting to be called the reverend so-and-so. You can also do the same thing insisting that people call you brother, right? I'm just a brother. Like the communists had everybody was comrade, right? Well, some were more comradely than others, and some brothers are more brothers than others. And the problem is the conceit. The problem is the arrogance. But when you have a defined external liturgy that's identifiable, it's very easy for people to start putting trust in that. And apart from grace, God despises it. Apart from grace, God despises your doctrine. Apart from grace, God despises your lifestyle. Apart from grace, God despises your liturgy, no matter how good it all is. Okay? And then last, 
Without grace, storytelling, narrative, confounds the protagonist and the antagonist. John 8, 39. You don't know who's who. You don't know who's the devil and who's Abraham and who's Jesus. And you, you get the story all jumbled up apart from grace. You don't know who the hero is. And with all these things, apart from grace, the better it is, the worse it is. Okay? Apart from grace, the better the doctrine is, the more dangerous it is. Apart from grace, the better the standards are, lifestyle standards are, the more threatening they are. Apart from grace, the better the liturgy is, the worse it is. And apart from grace, the better the narrative is, the worse it is, the more dangerous it is. Appealing to the argument or to the rules or to the tradition or to the history is all worthless apart from the experience and tasted goodness of God. And that means joy. Okay? How do you tell, we say, I keep saying without grace, without grace, without grace. Well, how, do you can, how can you tell if there's no grace? Well, the fruit of the Spirit, in, in the text, the fruit of the Spirit is as evident as the works of the flesh. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's not hard to miss, right? When you tell the story, when you affirm the doctrine, is it with joy? Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty. Or is it, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven. Are you rattling off your paternosters? Uh, in, in our Father, or are you robustly affirming that you believe these things, and are you doing it with joy? And do you exuberantly worship God in the liturgy with joy? Do you tell your children the story of your people with joy? Do you embrace the lifestyle standards because you you love living this way because it's it's pleasing to God and it's orderly and it's it's pleasant and it's good? Do you love it? So this means joy. Joy in the doctrine, joy in the living, joy in the worship and symbols, and joy in the story. The joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Now, one of the ways to tell if joy is missing, apart from the obvious, is that false oppositions are created. When people don't have joy, they create false oppositions. They set one thing against another. God gave all these things to us to be integrated together, and we try to make them enemies. We, we try to set one spoke at war with the other spoke. When God gave, gave us the axle. He gave us the whole wheel. He wants all of this in balance. And when we grab one and try to make it the adversary of the other, one man wants to turn it around. One wants to have, one wants to have this spoke and not that one. A robust understanding of a biblical worldview, a robust understanding of a, of a worldview wheel, embraces all of it and wants to have it as balanced as he can have it. The rationalist wants doctrine only. The rationalist wants doctrine only. The liberal wants morals only. The liberal wants morals only. The sacerdotalist wants liturgy only. The postmodernist wants narrative only. The biblical Christian wants it all. And he wants it all on the axle and balanced there. He wants all four things. He wants robust liturgy. He wants a robust affirmation of doctrine. He wants healthy Christian living. And he wants people to know the story of their people and know what the tradition is and how we got here. Now, two of these spokes involve actions, not words. The two others involve words, not actions. Two of them involve actions, not words, and two of them involve words, not actions. Lifestyle and liturgy are enacted, lived out. Lifestyle and liturgy you do with your body. Okay? Lifestyle and liturgy you do. In liturgy you kneel, you stand, you raise your hands, you sing, you hear. You're, it's, it involves the whole person. Okay, that, that's what liturgy does. Lifestyle does the same thing. It drives the car, goes to work, spanks the kids, teaches the spelling lesson, does all of these things. Lifestyle and liturgy are enacted. Stories, the narrative and doctrine, are spoken or written. We tell the story and we teach the doctrine by means of words. All four enter their glory when they are done or told 
from the heart, dependent on the grace of God, with joy. Now, let me say something about propositions, propositional knowledge. Postmodernists like to mock the doctrinal spoke. The, the people, I said postmodernists like the, the narratival spoke. They, they want that spoke and they mock the doctrinal spoke. But both of them are equally dependent upon words. Both of them are equally dependent upon propositions. But, but postmodernists who emphasize narrative and the storytelling and uh, the storytelling that we are uh, involved in, these, these people like to say, well, I don't want a, an arid propositionalism. I don't like propositions. And I'd say, okay, let me give you a proposition. Here's a proposition. Once upon a time, a little boy lived in a castle next to the sea, and a green dragon came after him. That's a proposition. In other words, every short story you've ever read depends entirely upon propositions. It's not just the Apostles' Creed and the shorter catechism that depend upon propositions. An exciting story about a boy and a dragon is as propositional as a statement of faith is. All right? Narrative story is propositional. Doctrinal affirmation is propositional. Propositions are not just the ingredient of a statement of faith. Propositions are the ingredient of storytelling. Uh, that's a green dragon is a statement of fact. Jesus is the son of God is a statement of fact. They are the same sort of thing. And you can tell stories just as you can affirm doctrinal statements and not have any experience of life. So... Stories are no more protected from becoming a series of abstractions than catechism answers are. Both are propositional. And lifestyle is no more protected from becoming an empty drill than liturgy is. The issue, therefore, is not what spoke we prefer or what emphasis we think needs to be restored, but whether God is pouring out his grace or not. Reformation is entirely and completely dependent upon the grace of God. And whether or not he bestows it is entirely up to him. But he promises to. We know that in the story of Scripture that he promises that over time he's going to bring his church to full glory. And so we know that that's where he's taking the story. And we simply want him to show more evidences of it now in our day where we can see it. And he invites us to pray that way and belong for that. We cannot create this axle, and we cannot, by arranging or juggling the spokes, connect them to the axle. That's God's kindness to us or not. But we look to him to fulfill his promises, and we should, we should argue with him covenantally. God wants us to be a little more argumentative. He wants us to pray like the psalmist prays. I mentioned last night that God will restore psalm singing to us, and one of the things that happens when you start singing psalms is you learn to talk back to God. Right? You learn to be a little mouthy, a little mouthier than you, you think is pious or devout. But the Bible defines piety. The Bible defines devotion. Right? And when the psalmist says, God, are you sleeping or something? <laughs> Wake up. Don't you see that I'm in trouble? Hmm? Now, that, the psalmist does that more than once. I grew up in a family... That was, we were taught to always pay attention to the words of the hymns. And if the second verse was problematic, it wasn't sound, you didn't sing it. So there were times when our family would be at church and we'd go all quiet on the second verse because that's not true. That verse is not true. And that habit was instilled deeply in me. And then after we went to psalm singing, I was astonished to find myself doing that with some of the songs. I would, I would be singing along and I'd say, oh, that's not right. And then I'd say, oh, wait a minute. It's the Bible. <laughs> and I'd look it up in the, I'd go from the metrical psalm to the Bible and say, yeah, it does, it does say that. I need to conform my prayer life to what the Bible tells me to do and be shaped by the Bible rather than my abstracted ideas of piety. So we must turn away from vainglory. If, if we're experiencing the grace of God in all of these things, then we're going to be enjoying all of them. It's going to be life, not death. 
It's going to be liberation, not slavery. It's going to be God's goodness. We're going to experience God's goodness as God's goodness. And if we're not doing that, there's only one alternative. In the text, the flesh and the spirit war with one another. So either it's going to be done by the spirit liberating you, or it's going to be according to the flesh. And if it's according to the flesh, then it's going to have certain characteristics. And we'll conclude with this uh, last exhortation from our text. The spirit and the flesh contend with one another, it says. If the spirit is at work in our midst, he will do glorious things. If the Spirit's at work in our midst, He will do glorious things, and these are the things He will work with. He will do glorious things with our doctrine. He will do glorious things with our lifestyle. He will do glorious things with our liturgy. And He will do glorious things with the story that we tell one another about who we are and where we came from. He will do glorious things with all of this. Now, how will the flesh counterattack? How will the flesh counterattack? Because the spirit and the flesh contend, right? The spirit and the flesh are fighting with each other. So when the spirit pushes the flesh, this is how the spirit pushes the flesh. The spirit pushes the flesh by giving us joy and grace and peace and kindness in these four things. And when the flesh pushes back, how does the flesh push back? How will the flesh contend with the Lord's work in these areas among us? What must we do if we want to walk in the spirit in these areas? Well, not to put too fine a point on it, as we look at the text, we should avoid vainglory, we must avoid provocation of others, and we must avoid envy. Basically, vainglory, boasting to others, provocation, poking others, and envy, being hostile at the good fortune of others. These are the ways that the flesh will try to disrupt faithful liturgy, faithful doctrinal affirmation, faithful living, and faithful storytelling. Envy is a disaster when you envy. And I'm going to be talking more about this uh, uh, tomorrow on the Lord's Day, this, this issue of envy. Envy is a disaster when you envy, and it, it is a disaster when you provoke by wanting to be envied. Right? Vainglory is when you want to be envied, and you're on the opposite end of the equation when you're envying. And all of it is vainglory, whether you say it out loud or not. Here are ways the flesh can disrupt our assembling of this wheel. Our liturgy is more refined than yours. Our liturgy is higher than yours. Our liturgy is more biblical than yours. There's a sentiment straight out of hell, straight from hell, piping hot. (laughs) Why, why would Christians talk like that? Our liturgy, a little uplifted nose, our liturgy is more covenant renewal-like than yours. Oh, my stories are not cliched and formulaic like so-and-so's. Well, good for you, and may we, may we touch the hem of your garment. <laughs> Here's a popular one. Our family has much better entertainment standards than some families in this church do. This must explain why your family is no fun at all. <laughs> Our family, we don't watch that kind of movie. Now... I know that there are crappy movies out there, right? And I know there are movies you ought not to be watching. But I also know that a bunch of people who don't watch the crappy movies are not watching them for all the wrong reasons. And the reasons for not watching them are just as messed up as the people who have all the discernment of a vacuum cleaner, you know. So, uh, yeah, there are problems with entertainment standards, and we should have higher entertainment standards. But... There's a way of having higher entertainment standards that is just prissy and prim and obnoxious, and it's the flesh. Okay? There, are, there is as much flesh in denunciations of poor movies in Christian churches as there was on the screen in those movies. Okay? Lots of flesh on the screen in that movie and lots of flesh in the pursed lips that said, tsk, tsk. flesh there, flesh there. What's the, who cares? 
right? It's all fleshly. That's the kind of thing that Paul is addressing. Or doctrinally. Our kids memorized the shorter catechism in the original Greek by the time they were three. <laughs> well, raw. You know. So, please remember that this is all a matter of God's grace. By talking about this, we, there's no way we can get into the machinery and tinker with it and make the grace go. Right? We're dependent upon God's grace. God's grace is God's grace. He bestows it. Right? Now, the Bible does say that when the word is declared, that's one of his instruments for bestowing it. But we don't whistle him up. We, we don't manipulate God. We talk with him. We talk back to him. If we pray like the, the psalmist, we hold him to his covenant promises. We pray. We plead with him. And we describe what it's like when God intervenes. And we know that in church history, generally speaking, when God's people describe what a godly, integrated life is, that's one of the central means that God uses for bringing those, that kind of integration about. Not because we can put, treat, it's not a paint by numbers kit that we can just do, but it is something that we can describe and we can say this is, one, this is the way God wants his covenant people to live and function. And he wants us to boast in him when he gives this present to us. So the standards that people boast in are often true standards, but they're boasting in themselves for having been so clever as to come up with the true standards. And rather, we ought to embrace the true standards in all four of these areas, but boast in the Lord. The Bible says this over and over again, let him who boasts boast in the Lord. But the, we're, we're even sneaky with that. The Pharisee in the temple knew that. What I just said, boast in the Lord, he knew that. He thanked God that he's not like other men. Right? Sola Deo Gloria. Right? That's a, he was a Reformation uh, five solo man. Um, Sola Deo Gloria. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other men. Now, is it wrong to thank God that he delivered you from sin when you see some wino on the street or you see some of the famous Puritan quote when he saw someone being taken off to be hanged and he said there but for the grace of God go I is was he being like the Pharisee well verbally the Pharisee was being like him but the attitude was completely different Jesus was talking about the supercilious way that the Pharisee said that there wasn't a problem with what he said if you're not like other men if God has spared you you should thank God that you are not like other men there's nothing wrong with what he said. The problem was with the way he said it. Right? And so the Puritan, I think it was Bradford, I forget what the Puritan said, he saw the man taken off to be hanged, is there, but for the grace of God, go I. Winston Churchill one time saw a man, a pretty stuck up, arrogant man, and he said, there, but for the grace of God, goes God. You know, right? uh, there are ways that we can affirm the right thing and it's all the wrong way and because the world's an interesting place there are some people who affirm the wrong thing in the right way they've got more of the spirit of christ in their messed up doctrine than people who have the the right doctrine have this is why i said the right doctrine is more perilous if we if the grace of god is not there present with us so the standards that people boast in are often true standards, but we want to boast in the Lord, not in the standard. And we want to genuinely boast in the Lord, not in ourselves for having understood these things in our own wisdom and autonomy. Humility is not relativism. Humility is not relativism. And humility will frequently be accused of being prideful. And that's all right, because humility understands that you don't deserve better than to be accused of things like that. And so we just accept it. Humility is not relativism. Humility has a backbone. Grace has a backbone. And this is what it looks like. So let's thank our God together. Father, we thank you for your kindness and goodness to us. We thank you for this opportunity to think through these things. And I pray you bless us as we seek to look for places to apply them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks for listening to this week's edition of the All of Christ for All of Life podcast. That was Douglas Wilson's talk, The Integrated Life. You can find that talk and the whole collection 
titled The Integrated Life on the Canon app.